Are flags of convenience an inconvenient truth for the shipping industry? Panama deregisters the Iranian oil tanker seized by Britain's armed forces and dozens of other ships too. Why are they sailing under a foreign flag? And should the practice be stopped? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Deri Nabugeda. The threat of military action between Iran and the UK over seized oil tankers is provoking a debate about a common practice in the shipping industry. Many vessels are owned by companies in one country but registered in another. An example is the Iranian tanker detained by Britain's Royal Marines a couple of weeks ago. The British government said the Grace One was stopped near Gibraltar for carrying oil to Syria in violation of EU sanctions. Like around 7,000 ships worldwide, the tanker was sailing under the flag of Panama. But the Panamanians say they removed the supertanker from their shipping register two months ago. And they're deregistering another ship which disappeared from tracking maps in the Strait of Hormuz last week. Well, under international law, every commercial ship must be registered in a specific country. Many ship owners choose a foreign country to register in a practice known as flag of convenience. The flag state is responsible for safety inspections and working conditions of the crew. Ships registered under flags of convenience can often reduce operating costs, avoid regulations and hire cheap crews. Panama has the world's largest shipping registry, followed by Liberia and the Marshall Islands. Critics, though, say the practice allows substandard regulations and makes it hard to hold ship owners to account. And some shipping is involved in crimes such as smuggling weapons or illegal drugs. Let's bring in our panelists for this discussion via Skype from Kingston in the Canadian province of Ontario. We have Hu Chang Hassan Yari. He's a professor of international relations and security issues at the Sultan Qaboos University in Oman. Joining us from London is Phil Diacon. He's a maritime security analyst, also a partner at the maritime security risk consultancy Dryad Global. And over in New Jersey via Skype, we have Lawrence Brennan. He teaches maritime law at Fordham University. Thanks very much for joining us on Inside Story and welcome uh, to all of you. Uh, Phil, if I may start with you over in London, is it fair to say that part of that cheaper and easier process of registration in another country does mean fewer regulations for these ships and recent incidents in the Gulf are now shining a spotlight on certain issues? I think it's fair to say that the industry as a whole has improved its standards considerably over the last decade or so. And most of the uh, prominent flags of convenience are all signatories to the, um, the best and highest standards. The thing to remember is that a flag of convenience is an effective, effectively a business. And the businesses are trying to attract their customers. And we talked about Panama being the largest. So what it offers is a set of regulation and standard. And as you mentioned, every vessel has to ascribe to a flag. And therefore, it's trying to attract as much business to itself. Now, they may all ascribe to the highest standards, say, for environmental, for ship uh, safety and welfare, and some of the areas you've already mentioned. And whilst the you know, flag of convenience, in this case, Panama, is the largest, there are others also vying for business. So I'm not sure it's fair to say that it's, it's a way of avoiding issues, but each vessel owner will start decide, based on their own business metrics, as to which flag they will ascribe to. Um, over to Lawrence Brennan, just break down for us, if you may, uh, when a merchant ship registers with a country known, as we're saying, as its flag state, what does this actually mean in terms of how much oversight and jurisdiction the country has over the vessel? It, the country has over, administrative oversight over the vessel, the manning, the crew, the safety and, and security regulations. Uh, but not to the exclusion of other nations. Uh, depending on the circumstances, the location of the ship, other nations, especially port states, have the right to inspect and regulate. Uh, flags of convenience can be of high quality, and some are not of the same quality. And as, as my colleague noted earlier, there's been a, an improvement. But throughout the 1960s and 70s, most of the major environmental disasters were on tank vessels, tankers, 
that were flying flags of convenience. And a lot of those were old ships that could no longer survive. After OPA 90, the Exxon Valdez disaster, the older tankers, 25 years and older, and the single hull tankers were, were taken aside. But we've had similar problems to the ones we're seeing in the Persian Gulf, uh, Strait of Hormuz, and even the, in the Gulf of, uh, Gulf of Oman uh, in the 1980s in the tanker war involving Iran and to some extent Iraq and the United States, where there was war declared on tankers bound for each other, the enemy. Iran would attack tankers bound for Iraq and vice versa. Ultimately, the United States volunteered to represent uh, other nations and defend certain tankers that were being attacked. And in fact, the Kuwaiti tankers were reflagged as U.S. ships in the late 1980s. Uh, the flag of convenience, uh, States are parties to many of the international treaties. Uh, there are questions and disputes among the experts as to the ability of those ships to be inspected and investigated. Uh, but a lot of that work is done by classification societies. And again, some experts will disagree that uh, classification societies are equal in their representation and their skills. Uh, in the United States, uh, the American Bureau of Shipping is not a national society, but is the society that uh, does most of the inspection for U.S. flagships and in some part for the U.S. Coast Guard. But Lloyd's Register, there's an Italian registry, a German registry, and, and they have many skilled professional surveyors, former captains of ships, former chief engineers, and, and licensed professional engineers. Let me cross over to Canada and uh, Huchang Hassan Yari. So obviously um, what we're hearing from uh, the panelists is that this is a money-making industry for countries like Panama and Liberia who offer this type of service. But why do you think countries flock uh, to Panama and Liberia and why do they register their ships over there? Uh, as my colleagues mentioned, there, uh, there are a number of countries who are known uh, to have uh, uh, the ma vast majority of the ships under their flag. Uh, Panama, uh, Marshall Islands, and uh, Liberia, Liberia, although Liberia is not as active as uh, before. Uh, a, a number of issues, for example, when uh, the Americans in the uh, early 1920s, uh, they decided to do that, uh, it was uh, somehow to... Uh, to make a detour and uh, uh, undermine uh, the uh, uh, non-alcohol uh, serving uh, uh, regulations that existed during those days. So by uh, putting uh, another country's flag, uh, that, that restriction was uh, eliminated. Uh, there are other cases of that nature, but there is a combination of, uh, uh, of business uh, uh, modeling a number of uh, uh, companies uh, they benefit from uh, the, the flag of uh, convenience uh, some others uh, they don't want to get to take responsibility for uh, for the for the ships I mean the states I'm talking about and uh, so a combination of reasons uh, uh, came together in order to uh, put us in the situation that we are dealing now. So and would you say the then it's a fair system, um, uh, Huchang Hassan Yari, is it a fair system which allows these countries to uh, avoid all sorts of things like taxes, inspections and labor laws? Not necessarily, because, for example, avoiding taxes uh, is not uh, uh, convenient for the country that loses that, uh, that tax, uh, uh, but it's good for the company uh, the, who is benefiting from this situation. Uh, it's like, for, for example, you, um, a, a plane. A plane is uh, purchased by a company in, let's say, uh, uh, any given country. Uh, that uh, uh, plane comes under the uh, jurisdiction of the purchaser, uh, and then uh, so they uh, they uh, they use and uh, they benefit from the services uh, that uh, of that uh, of that plane. Uh, in some other cases, when there is not such a thing, uh, and then that creates this is why the murky waters really uh, uh, become uh, uh, now uh, they, they came to surface. Uh, in this context of uh, uh, conflict and uh, arresting, uh, confiscating uh, ships and so forth. So there is a need really to uh, improve even further, as, although my colleagues mentioned that, that uh, the situation that we are living now is much more uh, convenient and much more improved in comparison to the old uh, regulations that existed. Uh, but there is a need really uh, to uh, review 
the dossier uh, in order to uh, make it very, very clear uh, that uh, each ship that is uh, has a flag, uh, that flag is the real one and not just uh, uh, convenient uh, convenient uh, for the for for the owners. Uh, for example, uh, the Panama is registering a number of ships uh, online uh, without even seeing those uh, those ships, and that is creating a problem. This is why, uh, in the past few years, uh, it seems that the, the uh, government in Panama they uh, uh, they deflight uh, a big number of those ships uh, for a number of reasons: the violation of uh, international law and so forth. And some of those flags uh, were used by, by the Iranians. Uh, so uh, although the system is not fair, uh, but in the absence of a better system, uh, we have to deal with the situation that uh, uh, we are confronting now. And that is not uh, 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 clearly uh, the, an ideal situation. Phil, over to you. Uh, as. Um... Uh, our panelist from Canada was saying Panama has now decided to deregister a number of ships. We're hearing up to 60 ships over the past few months, and that includes the Grace One. That's the Iranian tanker that has been and is still detained, as you know, in Gibraltar by UK authorities. To what extent uh, do you think Panama is be being pressured to do so at this point? And if it is being pressured, by whom? So the International Chamber of Shipping. Um, monitors the flag states. It publishes annually the performance of flag states. And uh, the performance is measured in many, many categories and is publicly available. The purpose of that is to keep accountability amongst the flag states for the very reasons that we've just been discussing. Now, the flag states are businesses, so they're going to be concerned about their reputation and their ability to attract business or ships into their registry. And therefore, if there's a reputational issue, such as a vessel that is deemed to be um, breaking sanctions and operating effectively illegally, then it's up to them to really take action and clean up their portfolio. So in this situation, cleaning up the portfolio is a regular event, but we are obviously very much aware of this one because this one's in, in the news and it's very current. So the flag states, um, they are businesses. They want to attract business and be seen to be compliant, which most of them are and the very large ones are. And also those vessels that are registered with those flag states the owners of them, the operators of them, they also want to be associated with a compliant business or a compliant process and registration process. So this cleaning up is probably housekeeping that you'd see in any business where um, there's a regular turnover of vessels. Uh, we just mentioned about applying online. Now, if you've got a large um, volume of vessels moving around in terms of their registrations, then to an extent, you know, your, your administration of it and your ability to administer it uh, effectively with inspections, which should of course happen every time there's a, uh, re a registration onto your flag, amongst many things, um, then in, there will probably, you know, there'll be the situations where perhaps there's a lag between registration and inspection. Right. So the example given there of applying online, you would expect it to be caught up eventually to be conform conforming to the process of registering for your flag. Right. Uh, Lawrence, uh, what do you make of this concept of uh, cleaning up and particularly at this point in the context of all the regional Tensions. Is it is it Panama cleaning up, or how much pressure do you, do you think Panama was under, and by whom, uh, to deflag uh, the Iranian ships that they have in the past few months? I, I think there's no dispute that the United States has encouraged Panama, Liberia, Marshall Islands, and maybe others uh, to take appropriate action to ships that are engaged in improper and unlawful conduct, such as smuggling, uh, trafficking drugs, violating sanctions. Uh, such as was done at the early 20th, 19th century by the U.S. and the British Navy in, in fighting the slave trade. Uh, one of the important things to realize is the international nature of maritime commerce. There's $35 trillion invested every year in world global trade, most of which 80% or so goes by sea, and the infrastructure, ships, ports, facilities. And that's a lot of money. It's really the, the driving force of the world economy. Oil is a significant part of that. It's may, probably the most valuable commodity traded. Uh, where ship owners try to save some money is on crew. It's called manning expenses, uh, bunkering expenses, a small amount. And the quality of the ship and the ability to keep a ship in service 
longer and with fewer problems is important. So it's a business competition between competing problems for the managers of a vessel. Do we repair a ship? Do we keep it another two years? Do we get rid of it and buy a new ship? What's the economic benefit? Okay, it's the same let me way just pick up does. on that point with you, Lawrence. So clearly there is a big economic um, angle to this. So if a vessel gets deflagged, then the owners of the ships might have to register the ships in their countries. And correct me if I'm wrong here, but so what are the economic implications of that? Well, the, the U.S. is the great example. We have a thing called the Jones Act which requires U.S.-owned, U.S.-flagged, U.S.-manned ships to trade between two American ports. So if you want to bring oil from the U.S. Gulf Coast to New Jersey, you need a U.S.-flagged ship. There are some interesting exceptions for cruise ships and passenger liners. But if you have a U.S. crew, it's probably three times the amount of cost. Now, the magic issue that makes all ships equal is insurance and particularly environmental insurance. What is the, what's the cost of having environmental coverage, pollution coverage under the Protection and Indemnity Club, P&I cover, and the Certificate of Financial Responsibility? No ship, particularly no tanker, is going to get into a port without having a Certificate of Financial Responsibility to show that if there's a pollution event, there's millions of dollars available to respond to that pollution event. And we've seen that historically in the world for the last 60 or 70 years, and we've seen some ships break up and, and can't get to what's called a port of refuge. Those are real problems. The first thing we did at the beginning of the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait was to make sure that Iraq could not use its ships in global trade, its tankers. And we were particularly concerned that they would use those tankers to cause an environmental disaster. So the British government, the ministry, the foreign ministry, and the U.S. State Department, where I was secunded, as they say in London, uh, for my Navy duties, we arranged for an order of counsel, and U.S. and British insurers were prohibited from providing marine insurance to Iraqi flagships in 1990. That wasn't the first time it's done. It's been done for hundreds of years, right. and it's, it continues to be done. Okay, over to um, Canada and Huchai Hassan Yari. What is uh, this deregistration that we're seeing by Panama? Is it, in your opinion, a way to pressure Iran to keep pressure on its economy, on its oil flow? I think he's part of that, uh, uh, that pressure because uh, Iran doesn't have uh, the, uh, the, the fleet that can uh, uh, use in order to uh, ship its oil uh, to the market. Uh, or bring uh, uh, bring uh, uh, the merchandise that uh, it's uh, uh, is purchasing. Uh, for example, if you look at the current situation, there are two Iranian ships that are stuck uh, in in Brazil uh, because they uh, they are not uh, they, they 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 cannot get fuel uh, by the the service by the Brazilians uh, because of the sanctions, and consequently uh, that puts a lot of pressure on. Uh, on the Iranian uh, regime in terms of uh, uh, hardening the sanctions that uh, are imposed on them by uh, different international uh, entities. Uh, so uh, the, this, is the, this is a reality uh, that uh, the Iranian system, the Iranian regime has to uh, deal with uh, and uh, the, it, it, makes it, uh, it, it makes Iran even more vulnerable uh, to uh, uh, flagging, uh, to uh, uh, renting, uh, and uh, to use the service of the ships that are uh, uh, that are available, but there is no doubt that um, the, uh, uh, Iran cannot use the service of the ships that is available uh, to many so many other countries uh, precisely because of uh, the kind of relationship that uh, it uh, uh, entertains uh, with the rest of the community. Could there community. be any security risks, however, um, uh, Huchang, to widespread deregistering of ships, and particularly in hotspot areas like the Strait of Hormuz? I believe so, because uh, then uh, when, uh, uh, like the, the, the other ship that now is uh, uh, um, uh, it's, uh, arrested by the Iranians, um, the, this river uh, that was disappeared from the uh, from the radars for some time last uh, last Saturday a week ago, uh, uh, so now is in a limbo. This uh, this ship that is also the registered by uh, by Panama, uh, 
so that is, and then the question is really what to do with this trip. Uh, are the Iranians uh, going to uh, to to uh, just simply uh, let it s uh, sleeping in uh, one of the Iranian ports uh, for how long, and uh, who is going to take care of the uh, the crew, and there's so many other questions of that nature, without forgetting, obviously, uh, the question of insurance and, and the threat right. uh, against Let's put the, that, the, yeah. the, the physical. Let's put that to Phil, because I see you nodding your head. Phil, I'll give you an example. Uh, the Stena Impero, which is currently seized by Iran for, according to Iran, violating international maritime law, is in fact Swedish-owned. Uh, those on board are Indian, they're Russian, Latvian, and Filipino, we hear. But it's the UK flag that's flying that particular ship. So is that flag just symbolic, or to what extent does the UK now owe protection to that vessel? So you've just highlighted exactly the murkiness of what is the, the oldest form of globalization, international uh, aspects to shipping. So you've got UK registered, you've got Swedish owned, you've got those different um, interested uh, parties with the cargo. So it is, when it comes to who's got responsibility, Ultimately, Iran now has uh, an issue where it has impounded a vessel that has multiple interests. Nominally, it's the UK flag that sits above all. However, of course, you know, we've got a Swedish-owned vessel and we've also got uh, EU cargo. So, you know, there are other parties that are going to feel um, the impact of, the, of, of Iran's decision. But going back to the point before about is this going to happen in the Straits of Hormuz, this deregistration process, as, on a wider scale? I don't believe just because it's the Straits of Hormuz that's going to happen. What we're seeing is that pressure applied to flag states, either by themselves or by external parties, to enforce whatever um, sort of sanctions or other rules that are being broken and to take action against them. So in the case of perhaps the United States putting pressure on Panama to take a closer look at vessels that are conducting activities that are regarded as perhaps illegal or counter to certain agendas, then yes, we can see deregistration processes with all the problems that my colleague has just mentioned with stranded crews, stranded assets, and where do they go? In the case of a deregistered Iranian vessel, it can go back to Iran, but once it's then flagged with an Iranian flag, what can it do? We've just heard that its options really are limited. Uh, Lauren's final word to you. Do you think that we're going to see more deregistration and more targeting of fleets? Uh, yes, I, I think that's true. But there's an important economic issue that is easily confused with deregistration and the seizures of ships recently. And it's the general maritime practice. Ships in, in courts are personified. They're the same as a person. So when my client calls up and said uh, that a, a, a British flag tanker hit my fishing ship in the Strait of Hormuz and I have a maritime lien and I want you to arrest that ship, there can be an arrest, and it's a civil process. It normally doesn't occur with the Iranian Revolutionary Guard launching helicopters and small boats. It's usually an order from a judge in a maritime court, and it's brought out by a civil officer, the marshal, or in some other countries, the sheriffs. Right. Now, in a case, in a case like the one we saw involving Stena Impero, uh, that would have been done in a telephone call between the lawyers or representatives of the fish boat and the, and the tanker. And they would have said, hey, my fish boat got hit. It's your tanker's fault. You owe me $20,000, $100,000, $1, 000, $1,000,000. The owner of the tanker would say, I don't want my ship arrested anywhere, but particularly here and now, my insurers will be happy to give to you a document, a piece of security, a letter of undertaking, a promise to pay a certain amount on settlement or final judgment and appeal. Okay. That gets done around the world all the time. There's a confusion in the world now between sanctions and simple civil arrest. All right. On that note, I'll have to leave it there. We thank you very much uh, to all of my guests, Huchain Hassaniari, Phil Diakon, and Lawrence Brennan. Thanks very much for joining us. And thanks for watching the show. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. You can have further discussion by going to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is AJ Inside Story. From myself and the whole team here in Doha, goodbye for now.